Namaste, and welcome to our new series on Karma Yoga in Bhagavad Gita. I know I said I was never going to do a lecture series <laughs> ever, ever again, but this is by request. And so it has an element of interactivity, and the request is coming from you. Uh, and I know if one person has a doubt or a question, then there's a hundred people or more out there with the same doubt or question. So the question that started this all off was on our live stream the other day. What is the difference between ordinary karma and karma yoga? Karma, after all, is simply cause and effect. Uh, you do this, and from that, something else happens. So, karma falls into three categories. The first is Sanchari karma. Sanchari karma is all the karma from all of our previous lives. Many, many millions of births but that which is not uh, appropriate for this particular birth. We don't have the right circumstances or the right type of body or whatever it might be for any reason at all. It's uh, being held for future lives. Then there's prarabdha karma. Prarabdha means ripe. So the karma that is appropriate for this particular lifetime is called prarabdha karma. And then there's a third type of karma, which is the karma resulting from our activities in this life. And that, of course, cannot be experienced in this life. Contrary to most people's erroneous beliefs, it has to be held for some future life where we have the appropriate conditions to experience it. So these three types of karma. Now, what is karma yoga? Well, yoga, the word yoga, comes from yukt, the verbal root yukt in Sanskrit, which means to join or to hook up, to join together. For example, you would use it uh, to describe hooking up a horse to a cart, or something like that. So, in our particular case, what we're doing is hooking up our individual consciousness and being with the supreme, absolute, the infinite consciousness and being, Brahman. And when we do this, then whatever actions we perform in that spirit do not generate any karma at all. And this is called akarma or naishkarma. So the whole point of karma yoga is to perform activities without being attached to the result because the result is offered to God. So that's just a very brief summary of what karma yoga is. Now I want to talk about the situation in which Bhagavad Gita is spoken. Bhagavad Gita is part of a much longer work called Mahabharata. And Mahabharata, although it seems to be historical, Actually, there is no evidence uh, that it actually happened. Uh, it's more like a novel. 
you know, uh, some novelists like Dostoevsky or Melville or any of the great novelists used a story to make philosophical and moral points. And so the epic of Mahabharata, which may be the world's first epic, it may be the world's first novel, huh? it's very old, but uh, not older than the Vedas. <laughs> so it might be 2,000, 3,000 years old, something like that. And it introduces and really narrates the story of the Krishna avatar. Now again, whether Krishna actually appeared or whether this is just a story about, you know, this character, Krishna, doesn't really matter. What matters is that this great story, this epic adventure, lasts for hundreds of years. Uh, the story, the storyline lasts for hundreds of years and shows the uh, preparation, the prelude, the actual incarnation and leelas or pastimes of Krishna, and then what happened afterwards. So very briefly, there was a conflict between two branches of a family line of kings. And this particular family line uh, was due to become the emperors of the Vedic Empire, which is spread all over. This is historical fact that the Vedic Empire at one time reached from Eastern Europe all the way to Indonesia and parts of what we now call China and up into Tibet and Mongolia and places like that. So the Vedic Empire at one point was very extensive and whoever controlled that empire controlled the majority of wealth and population in the world. So it was a very big deal when one branch of the family rebelled against the ancient tradition of succession of kings and challenged the other branch, which were the rightful successors. And this conflict extended over, you know, several generations of the family and finally wound up in a huge war. And basically all the governors and kings and soldiers in the world were a part of this war, which took place in the battlefield of Kurukshetra. So there are, you know, many details about this, which are very interesting. And I could go into it, I could rap about this for all day. But the most interesting part is that when it's nearly time to begin the battle, Arjuna, the head a uh, fighter of the uh, legitimate family of kings loses heart. He can't go through with it. And Krishna has become his charioteer. So he goes to Krishna, I can't do this. I'm not going to fight. And he throws down his weapons and he's just distraught. He's like on the verge of tears. And then so Krishna speaks the Bhagavad Gita, or actually sings it. Gita means a song. So whenever we quote a verse from Bhagavad Gita, we're going to sing it, not just recite it, uh, because it's a verse from a song. So we see the great intelligence of Krishna he is a self-realized being. Whether he's God or not, it doesn't really matter. The point is, he's aware of the ultimate conclusions of the Vedas, not just aware of them, not just in knowledge of them, but has actually realized them and is putting them into action. Action is karma. And karma, when performed as an offering to the Supreme, is karma yoga. So karma yoga is really the, uh, in one way, the theme 
of Bhagavad Gita and indeed the whole Mahabharata. How to act properly in all kinds of different circumstances in harmony with Dharma. That's why we call our channel Dharma Sar. Dharma Sara means the essence of Dharma. And what is the essence of Dharma? It is activity that leads to liberation. Actions that lead to release from all action. Karma that doesn't generate any karma. <laughs> so this is what is explained in the topic of karma yoga in Bhagavad Gita. Arjuna doesn't want to fight because he thinks it's wrong to attack his cousins. Krishna is telling him, no, as a king, your duty is to protect the citizens from this kind of immorality, from this kind of adharma, uh, this kind of vikarma, wrong action. Adharma means against dharma, against the principles of righteousness. And vikarma means prohibited or undesirable actions. So when the other branch of the family, the kurus, rebelled against dharma, it became Arjuna's duty to fight them because they wouldn't listen to reason, even though they tried for many, many years to reason with them. They wouldn't listen to it. They became obstinate and more and more violent and insulting. So, of course, a king cannot tolerate an insult. He has to fight. And a Vedic king cannot tolerate an insult to Dharma. He has to fight for the sake of Dharma. So Krishna is telling him, this is your duty. It's not about whether you like to do it or not. You gotta do it, you have to do it, because this is Dharma. See, and this is our condition. This is everyone's condition in human life. We don't want to fight for Dharma. We don't want to struggle for liberation. We don't want to do the work that leads to enlightenment. Why not? Oh, we just want to have fun, or we want to take care of our family, or we want to be rich and powerful and famous and whatever. But the path of religion seems like it's poison to us because we have to give up so many things. Well, <laughs> it's not really like that. The only thing we have to give up is attachment to the results of our activities. So Krishna is telling Arjuna to fight, but not be attached to the result. And indeed, we see this in Arjuna's attitude. He's ready to give up the kingdom. He's ready to give up his exalted title as one of the emperors. He's ready to chuck it all and go to the Himalayas and just sit in a cave and be a yogi. He doesn't want to do his duty. So this is actually a good attitude. But then Krishna, slowly, slowly, through the whole Gita, 18 chapters, convinces him that you have to do your duty whether you like it or not. So the first duty of human life is to strive for liberation. And the reason for this is that we are suffering. We're suffering, and the cure for suffering is spiritual liberation, enlightenment, moksha. Uh, if we don't attain moksha, or if we don't strive to attain moksha, we are actually acting against our own best interests. Even though it might seem like poison in the beginning, it's nectar at the end. And whereas worldly happiness seems like nectar in the beginning, but it's poison at the end when death forces us to give it up. So this is the theme of Bhagavad Gita and particularly Karma Yoga. 
And so we're going to describe this verse by verse in the relevant chapters of Bhagavad Gita, chapter 3, seven, uh, 16 and 17. So I hope you stay with us. Uh, watch the playlist. And I'll put a link to the playlist in the video description so you can just watch, binge watch the whole thing if you want. <laughs> it's more interesting than Foundation series or Mandalorian or whatever, because this is directly applicable to your well-being for all eternity. Aung Tatsat. Aung Shakti Aung.